Texas A&M has routinely over the last several years been the butt of jokes in college football. And here we are once again, spring football has rolled around and everyone's starting to think about how close college football is and whether or not Texas A&M is a legitimate team in the SEC as far as it goes to, you know, contending for a conference championship. Do you know the last time Texas A&M put a double digit number in the left column? That's the win column. Do you know the last time? 2012. Mm, mm. There was this guy, Jonathan Manziel. He went by Johnny Football. That's the last time Texas A&M put up a double digit win season. Now there was the COVID year. They had a lot of success, but again, it's been quite a long time. So when you look at the FanDuel win total and say, wait a minute, are we doing this again with Texas A&M? Whether it was the Kevin Sumlin teams or the Jimbo Fisher teams or at any team that we have seen, it feels like Texas A&M wins the off season, but never wins during the season. So now Mike Elko takes over. He was their defensive coordinator. He was the head coach at Duke. He's now the head coach at Texas A&M. And Jimbo Fisher's making $75 million to not coach Texas A&M football. Look, I understand work gives you purpose and work gives you a routine, but that's not a bad life. That is not a bad life. So their fan to, their, their fan duel win total, Texas A&M, is eight and a half. And I'm sure a lot of people are rolling their eyes going, oh my gosh. Here we go again. Here we go. Texas A&M. Oh, yeah. Winners of the offseason. Is Mike Elko that sort of guy? I will not speak for uh, Zach Blackerby. He spoke for himself earlier on the show and whether or not he thinks Mike Elko is any good. We're going to find out this year how good Mike Elko can be. This is not something that is going to need to marinate for a while. I'm not saying you need to see you know, a, a conference championship or even an appearance in 2024, even though... I think this year's Kalen DeBoer Alabama team will be the worst team that he has. I think they're going to be good, by the way. But year one, there's going to be a transition element. There's going to be an adjustment and whatnot. So Alabama is about as down as they are going to be relative to Alabama standards. They're also not on Texas a and schedule. Yeah, remember that one. Uh, do you know who has the second highest rated transfer portal class according to 24-7 Sports? That's the Texas a and Aggies. This is not a coaching move bringing over Mike Elko that has gone under the radar. He's not going to a program that fails to attract talent. What Texas A&M has failed in over the years is the ability to be well coached and well prepared and just be able to flat out execute with the talent that they do have. Now, there have been a lot of big time names that have gone elsewhere. You can look at Walter Nolan going to Ole Miss along the defensive line. LT Overton on the offensive line left. Evan Stewart went to Oregon. Lots of names have left the program. Do you know how many transfers Texas A&M has brought in this year? Did you know that the answer is 24? Well, now you do. 14 of those transfers, by the way, are coming from power four institutions. That doesn't mean that they're the only transfers worth mentioning. That doesn't mean they're the only transfers that are going to make an impact this year. I'll get to the quarterbacks in just a moment, but I expect Cyrus Allen to be one of the guys that they are throwing the football to there week in and week out, whether they're at College Station or or on the road. Because when you look at what Allen did last year at Louisiana and you say, well, Evan Stewart is is not there, and Allen, you know, almost 800 receiving yards with uh with louisiana tech that that's the sort of guy who comes in and is not going to go to texas a&m and be as highly coveted of a transfer portal recruit if he's not going to play so just because you're coming from a lower level institution doesn't mean you can't be a big impact guy how many times whoever you are a fan of in college football and you're listening to or watching the show right now i thank you for doing that by the way how many times has a guy come from a group of five school or the FCS level and made a big impact? One guy who is coming from the power level, but maybe isn't generating a whole ton of buzz to people outside of Texas A&M that I wouldn't sleep on is EJ Smith. He's a running back. Now, if you think Smith and running back and think about the letter E as a first name, you may be wondering whether or not this individual has any relation to Emmett Smith. You'd be correct to think that because 
As a matter of fact, he does. E.J. Smith is the son of legendary running back Emmett Smith. He went to Stanford for a couple of years and wasn't able to carve out a consistent role. There were uh, a couple of injury problems, but primarily he was in the middle of mm, not the best time of Stanford football. Wasn't able to carve out a role. If you told me right now that EJ Smith pushes for a thousand yard season this year, I'd believe you. He's got that sort of talent. He is an incredibly balanced running back. But 24 transfers in total for Texas A&M this year, which leads to the next question. Well, how many teams on their schedule are going to compete with that? Sure, they had a bunch of guys leave, but look at all the guys that they brought in. They come in at all sorts of different position groups, by the way. They've got a top 20 high school recruiting class. That's never been the problem with Texas A&M. So when you ask yourself the question, are they worth preseason hype? You need to then ask, well, what sort of hype are we talking about here? A win total of eight and a half, I think is warranted. Here's why. I'm going to list to you in order every team on Texas A&M schedule. And from there, we're going to think about how many times they are just going to be outmatched with roster talent. Are you ready? Notre Dame, McNeese, Florida, Bowling Green, Arkansas, Missouri, Mississippi State, LSU, South Carolina, New Mexico State, Auburn, and Texas. How many of those teams, when I listed them, jumped out to you as, oh my gosh, they have way more talent than Texas A&M? I, Texas and LSU are the only ones I think even have more roster talent across the board than Texas A&M. You could maybe toss Notre Dame into that mix, but it's at the very least comparable. You know how I know that? Their week one game on August 31st, which can't get here soon enough, is Texas A&M minus one and a half against Notre Dame. Do you think Notre Dame's a good football team? I do. I, I do. I think Marcus Freeman's a good coach. I think Notre Dame's a good team. I think they've brought in Riley Leonard, who Mike Elko knows quite well since he was, when healthy, his quarterback at Duke for the last couple of seasons. And Vegas thinks that at home, Texas A&M, slight favorite there. So you've got three teams that can go toe-to-toe roster-wise with Texas A&M. Well, that's been the case in years past. But you've got a guy in there who went 16-9 and nine his last two years as the football coach at Duke. When you think about Duke and anything about them, football is the third thing that comes to mind. Number one, basketball school. Number two, premier academic institution. And number three, football. Because, well, we just all love college football and we know that, that Duke plays it, of course. But that's kind of the extent of what you think nationally, what a lot of fans think across the country of Duke football. But Mike Elko had them in a space where he's beating Dabo Sweeney. Do you think that guy can coach? Because I do. I, I do. I know Zach Blackerby doesn't believe in him. Locked on Auburn host. If you think that, or if you, if you think that Zach is wrong and want to let him know, his channel's freely available over on YouTube. You may drop him a comment. But I think that for, for Texas A&M, the question is not whether they have a good enough team to win nine regular season games. They have a workable schedule. There's no Georgia. There's no Alabama on there. You do have to go um, at Auburn on November 23rd. I would not sleep on that. But their two toughest SEC games, in fact, their three toughest games roster-wise that I mentioned are all at home. November, or sorry, August 31st against Notre Dame. October 26th against LSU, and then Texas comes to town in a classic SEC matchup. Oh boy, that's going to be a spicy game. That's going to be a spicy, spicy game on November 30th to end the regular season. All three games, their three biggest, hardest games, the best teams they'll play, it's at Kyle Field. They're all at Kyle Field. This is an incredibly workable schedule in the SEC. You've got a coach who's got plenty of talent. And the question may very well come down to what are you going to get from the quarterback position? Is Jalen Henderson going to push Connor Wigman at all? Is Connor Wigman the starter? Does he have enough weapons? I think so. I think there's still plenty of talent there for Texas A&M to be a good team as long as they reasonably play complementary football. I don't expect Connor Wigman to be someone that pushes for a Heisman Trophy or you know first or second team All SEC. 
But certainly, this feels like a Texas A&M team that roster-wise has got the capability to play good, solid, complementary football. Will they? That that's going to come down to every individual Saturday that gets played this fall and whether they can execute. But are the pieces there for this to be the year Texas A&M pops? I got to tell you, we watched Purdue play in the national championship game yesterday. They'd had their struggles in the tournament and it all came together. How many people going into the tournament? Me. It was me. I said, refused to pick Purdue because, well, they haven't done it in the past. Well, that doesn't mean they weren't capable. That just means they didn't. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.